Okay, we are moving, moving into the home stretch, three lectures. So the last three lectures, we're going to talk about something different. We're today on usual agents, one of my favorite. And then Wednesday and Monday, we are going to break the rule for this course and talk about specific viruses. We usually don't do that because I don't think it's a good way to teach virology virus by virus. But these last two viruses are pretty important. So we're going to talk about HIV on Wednesday and then avian influenza on Monday. Today, though, we're going to address this question. What's the smallest genome size that an infectious agent can have? In fact, could an agent even exist without a genome? And we're going to talk about Viroids, satellites, and prions, or prions, depending on how you want to say it, because it's a synthetic name, just like antivirals. Who knows how to pronounce them? Uh, we make a separate lecture for these, although we're going to draw upon a lot of the things we've learned in this course to understand how they work. They don't fit into the regular taxonomy for viruses, for sure. Viroids, as you will see, are major plant pathogens. Satellites are viruses that require other viruses for their replication. Whether they're actually viruses or not is being debated. And finally, we're going to talk about prions. What should I call them, prions or prions? Who likes prion? Who likes prion? Prion wins, <laughs> so prions it will be. All right, viroids first. These are amazing. They're just little pieces of RNA. They don't encode any protein and they have no capsid or envelope or protective coat at all. They migrate very effectively from host to host. They don't need receptors. Uh, they tend to get into cells by mechanical damage or by insects putting them into the cells. And there's a database of subviral RNA. So these are viroids or subviral RNAs, because I guess they're not quite viruses. And there's a database. There's so far 1,742 <coughs> different ones uh, that have been discovered so far. They are all small, circular, single-stranded RNA molecules. All right, so they're circular, single strands. That's what they all look like, all the viroids that have been discovered. They don't code for anything. If you put them in a plant, they replicate. And there are two, <laughs> there are two families. One family, Pospiviroidae. They replicate in the nucleus of the plant and the family Avsonviroidae replicate in chloroplasts. Really remarkable infectious agents, just RNA, no coding region. Maybe this is what viruses looked at in an RNA world. So the first one to be discovered is, they have great names, potato spindle tuber viroid, or PSTVD, that's how they're named, viroid VD, discovered in 1967. 359 nucleotides long. Um, and you see here, this particular, this is not potato spindle, this is a tomato plant, I believe. Uh, these have been inoculated with different strains of a viroid. Uh, this one is the control, it's a healthy plant. So they're inoculated when the plants are small and allowed to grow. And this is inoculated with a viroid of mild virulence, intermediate and very virulent. And you can see the growth of the plant is stunted. And in other viroids, there are various pathological lesions associated with infection. Some of these viroids do nothing. They're benign. And other ones are really important diseases of, of agricultural uh, plants. So uh, something that's worried about uh, amongst farmers. Some of my favorite ones are here on this slide, the Kadang, Kadang coconut viroid, which uh, causes a, a lethal disease of coconut palms. You can see this one here is infected. It's not, not doing very well. If you like pina coladas, you're not very happy with this particular viroid. Then there's the hop latent viroid, which infects hop plants, which of course are used to make beer, but it doesn't do anything. So you can still make your beer and it tastes the same. So no problem there. And then we have the apple scar skin viroid. Actually, this is what Steve Jobs was thinking, bless you, thinking of putting on his computers originally, but he decided it was too scary 
<laughs> this is, uh, makes apples look mottled like this one. The apples taste exactly the same as uh, an uninfected apple. Uh, but if you see these in the supermarket, I bet you wouldn't buy it because you'd think something was wrong with it, right? So um, that's why you don't see them there. I often look for these to see if I can find one so I could bring it here and show it to you, but I've no, not found one. So it just is a, uh, a viroid with mild symptoms that makes the apples look bad. So once again, they don't encode proteins. They don't even make an mRNA, which makes sense because why would you do that if you don't encode a protein? The RNAs, as you will see in a moment when I show you a picture, they're extensively uh, base paired. So these actually don't look like circles if you look at them by the electron microscope. They look like rod-shaped structures. And some of these viroids contain what are called ribozymes. These are RNA enzymes. Um, the RNA has autocatalytic ability. It can cleave itself, all right? And that's this activity, this ribozyme activity is, is needed for replication of the viroid. So a nice way to distinguish these from viruses, viruses are parasites of the host translation machinery. The viruses all make mRNAs. Remember the Baltimore scheme? mRNA in the middle. They need to, be trans they need to translate that mRNA by the host translation machinery. Well, viroids don't need to be translated. They don't encode protein. They are instead parasites of the transcription machinery. The enzymes that make mRNAs in the cell are the enzymes that replicate viroid genomes. So kind of a twist on the parasite approach. So here's the structure of potato sp uh, spindle tuber viroid, which I mentioned earlier, the first one discovered, showing you uh, the rod shape. And this occurs because it's extensively base paired throughout the RNA sequence. And there are various regions on this uh, viroid RNA that have been studied over the years. For example, this region on the left here is important for pathogenesis, for the ability of this viroid to cause disease uh, in the potato plant. So again, there are loops at the end, and most of the viroid RNA is base paired with a few uh, exceptions. How do they replicate? So they enter cells, and they are replicated by host RNA polymerase II, the enzyme in the host that makes mRNAs. And usually concatamers are made. In other words, multiple unit lengths of the genome joined to one another. And these concatamers are then cleaved. They can be either cleaved by a ribozyme, which is contained within the viroid, or they sometimes are cleaved by host nucleases. So ribozymes, again, are very, very famous RNA enzymes discovered in 1981. Uh, Tom Cech receiving the Nobel Prize for this discovery. Uh, and um, one group of viroids forms what's called a hammerhead ribozyme. This is an RNA secondary structure that looks like a hammerhead, hence the name. And it is able to cleave itself. So the, the RNA itself uh, is an enzyme. And again, this ribozyme is used to cleave these um, concatamers that are produced during replication. So one group of viroids encode in a ribozyme. I shouldn't say encode because that, that insinuates protein. They contain ribozymes in the RNA sequence. And another group uses host nuclear enzymes to cut up the concatamers of uh, RNAs that are produced, again, by Paul II uh, in the host. So, Amazing, these RNAs get into cells, plant cells. They can be introduced by insects. They can be introduced by farmers rolling over the plants with wheels that are contaminated with viroids from other plants. They can be introduced by planting. You bring in a new flat of, of plants and they have viroids in them and that introduces them to the rest of the crop. Here's uh, an example of how a member of the POSP, POSP viroidae replicate. These are viroids that replicate in the nucleus of the cell, uh, and they come in by whatever means. And remember, plant cells have a very you know, um, impermeable membrane around them, very difficult to get through, and so either a sharp uh, proboscis of an insect or damage gets them into the cell. The RNA, the ribozyme RNA, which is shown here as a circle, is brought into the nucleus where Paul II makes concatamers. So these are two unit lengths shown here, two copies of the genome. That's a minus strand. And then we think the same Paul II makes plus strands as well. So the incoming genome is simply called plus because it's the genome. But in terms of how I've taught you about positivity, it makes no sense whatsoever because there's no protein encoding here. It's just a 
a way of designated the, the, the viroid and the antiviroid. Uh, the plus strands are then brought into the nucleus, uh, sorry, the nucleolus, uh, where they are cleaved probably by host cell nucleases to unit lengths. They get ligated into circles and then they're exported out. And then they move to the next cell. You know, cells are connected by tunnels, as you can see here. And the things, components move from cell to cell via these, these pathways. And eventually the entire plant uh, will be infected. The avsun viroidi encode or contain hammerhead ribozymes. That's why we're showing it as this hammerhead-like structure. These come into the cell by similar means. They go into the chloroplast. This is where these replicate. Uh, we believe that uh, these are also copied, of course, by um, host cell RNA polymerases, but the cleavage step uh, occurs by the virus uh, ribozyme, maybe assisted by uh, host cell proteins. And then they fold back into a ribozyme, so that's the minus strand. It's copied again to form plus strands, the same concatamers which are cleaved by the ribozyme, exported from the chloroplast, and then moved to the next cell. So the RNA is recognized by the host cell polymerase, and it replicates and moves throughout the cell. Now, where did they come from? As far as, they've probably been around uh, for a long time. Uh, they probably entered crops as we learned how to become farmers uh, many years ago, our ancestors, uh, and we uh, started to breed crops. And then eventually, they were, vir viroids were most likely transferred from wild plants that were, were used to breed those originally. So they're present in the wild, most likely. And we have derived all of our crop plants, for the most part, from wild plants. Uh, and that's where they've come from. Now, if you know anything about farm farming now, we, uh, we, we do monoculture farming. We have genetically identical plant lines for whatever it is you want to grow, corn or wheat or any kind of grain. Uh, and uh, these tend to have uh, viroids in them. So uh, they're all the same, and so they're all uniformly susceptible to these viroids. <coughs> and as I've said, they're transmitted. Uh, you can clean up your plants and get rid of all the viroids, but if uh, a neighboring farm has uh, viroids in their plants, you can bring it over on equipment, hands, or even from plant to plant, because as plants grow in rows, they touch each other. So there can even be a plant to plant spread. How do they make the plants sick? So I showed you some examples at the beginning of plants that were either stunted or mis miscolored by uh, viroid infection. Well, this is an area of ongoing investigation, but the current idea is that the viroid RNAs are cut up by the, ma the machinery in the cell that's used to make uh, small interfering RNAs. Uh, so the RNAs get into the plant cell and the plant cell has an enzyme dicer that chops it up and makes small RNAs. And we think that these then silence host genes. And that's what causes disease in the plant. All right, so it's a viroid-derived small interfering RNA, but it happens to recognize or hybridize to a host uh, mRNA. And that causes degradation of the, of the host mRNA and therefore uh, the pathogenesis. And so that follows that symptom development in plants correlates with production of small RNAs. If you interfere with their production, you can alter the plant so it doesn't make microRNAs. You interfere with pathogenesis. And the pathogenicity modulating parts of the viroid, I showed you originally in the potato sp spindle tuber viroid, there's an area that controls pathogenesis. This is where the majority of these small interfering RNAs come from. So we don't really know why this has evolved to be this way. Has the uh, viroid evolved to produce small RNAs uh, to be of benefit to it? And these happen to cause pathogenesis accidentally? That, that still is an open question. So these are really remarkable um, molecules because they are the simplest viruses, I think. I, I don't see why we can't call them a virus. They're called viroids because they don't code anything. But it's really amazing that they can propagate, they use entirely the host cell machinery, and they can cause disease as well. Not all of them, but some of them can cause disease. So really interesting, minimal uh, infectious agents. How does the host RNA Paul 2 recognize RNA? Because I thought it needed a DNA substrate. It usually does, that's correct. And this is one of the, in very beginning of the course, I told you, remember, RNA genomes can't be recognized by host cell enzymes. I kept saying that over and over again so that you would understand that viruses need to encode their own RNA polymerases, right? 
what I said. But actually, there are a few exceptions, and, and, and the viroids are one of them. And we're going to see another exception also in today's lecture. So viroids and satellites apparently can be recognized by RNA Paul II. So then you may ask, why haven't viruses evolved to be independent of their own RNA polymerases? And we don't know the answer. There must be some other constraint, but it's a really interesting question. So, you know, I can't really introduce that exception at the beginning because then you wouldn't listen. So, but now it's okay because now you're all smart and have learned all this stuff. And it is which of the following is not a property of viroids? Why did you all put capsid, metastable capsid? They don't have capsids, right? They do not encode a metastable capsid. They don't encode any protein. They can't have a capsid, right? They have a ribozyme. They have a host, they're replicated by host RNA polymerase. They have a circular rod-like genome, but they don't have a metastable capsid. Okay. Next set of interesting infectious agents we call satellites. And again, the name is, is meant to distinguish them uh, from viruses, but this is just a human naming convention. It may not really be relevant, but it's, I guess it's good to help study these. Satellites are small. Single stranded RNA molecules is very much like uh, viroids in the sense that they're RNA, but these encode proteins. Um, some of them encode structural proteins that encapsulate the genome. Some of them don't encode anything like a viroid, but some of them do, and they're all satellites, so that's an exception there. For the most part, these uh, satellites don't have the genes needed to replicate. All right, so. They all don't have replication genes, and some of them don't have encapsidation genes. So in a sense, they are, some of them are viroid-like, but they have enough differences to be classified separately. And the main one is that they replicate in the presence of another virus, which is called a helper virus, which is very distinct from viroids. Yes? What do you mean by encapsidation genes? Sorry? What do you mean by encapsidation genes? Oh, proteins that encode a capsid, okay. um, glycoproteins, or a, a shell of some sort. Does that mean that some satellites have capsids? That's right. Okay. Some satellites do have capsids, yeah. And others are encapsidated by the helper. So the satellites are, in general, in a capsid. But where the capsid come from depends on the, on the satellite. So they replicate in the presence of another virus, which we call the helper virus. And the helper allows, uh, provides replication proteins for all of the satellites. And for some, it provides the capsid protein. Okay. So satellites are very common in plants also. I don't know why the plants have a lot of these odd infectious agents, viroids and now satellites. And the satellite makes the disease caused by the helper virus different. So that's why I say it causes distinct disease symptoms not seen with the helper virus alone. So that the satellite is doing something in addition to the helper to give distinct symptoms. They are typically not related to the helper virus. So they're not simply defective helper viruses that have lost genes and become unable to replicate. They are distinct entities which have evolved to utilize the helper viruses, but they are, there's no homology with the helper typically. Yes? Are satellites helper virus specific? Yes, they are helper virus specific, right? So a satellite has its own helper virus, and the helper of one satellite will not help uh, another satellite, correct. So let's look at some of these satellites. This is just a selection to give you an idea. So there are, um, there are satellite viruses of eukaryotic cells. Uh, so for example, this is the way this table is laid out. There's the helper first, and then a slash, and then the satellite virus. So there are some single-stranded uh, DNA virus is called dependo virus. <laughs> Clever, right? Because they depend on another virus. <laughs> or parvoviruses that are, are defective and they require adenoviruses or herpes viruses as helpers to, in order to replicate. Uh, these are encapsidated. Uh, they have a, here's the genome size, 4,700 nucleotide. The particle is 20 to 24 nanometers. And these are some uh, of the proteins encoded uh, in the helper genome. And then you see a whole series of um, helper satellite pairs for insects uh, and plants. So we have uh, a B virus and a B virus associated satellite. 
Um, we have uh, viruses of plants, tobacco necrosis virus, which is quite a famous one and is, as you might guess, agriculturally important associated with its satellite. And again, tobacco necrosis virus on its own will cause plant disease, but with the satellite, the disease is different. So the satellite is modifying the disease. Uh, here's another uh, plant virus, a, a virus of corn and its satellite and so forth. All right, so they're pairs, as you asked. These are very specific pairs, and one, one helper doesn't help another satellite virus. And again, get a sense of the genome size. Some of them are rather small, not as small as viroids, because again, they encode uh, a couple of proteins. Some of them just one protein, and some of them a couple. So those are satellites. Now, there is one satellite that infects humans. All right, we haven't found any viroids yet. Who knows, we might find one one day. But there is one satellite that infects humans. It's called hepatitis delta virus. It's classified as a satellite because it needs a helper in order to replicate. But it has properties of both viroids and satellites, as you will see. Its helper is hepatitis B virus. And it is often found in people who are infected with hepatitis B virus. It's never found by itself. You need to have hepatitis B infection to have hepatitis delta. When it was first discovered, it was thought that it made hepatitis B more severe, but this has turned out to be a controversial finding, and as far as I can see, nobody believes it anymore. So you don't have any evidence that Delta is modifying uh, the disease caused by hepatitis B virus. Here's the global distribution of hepatitis Delta virus, or hepatitis Delta satellite virus. Uh, about 18 million people are infected. That's about 5% of the 350 million people who are infected with hepatitis B virus. And you, it used to be uh, quite prevalent in Europe. The incidence is going down. Now the Asia Pacific, uh, some areas having very high prevalence, as you can see here. Um, and um, so th again, you acquire infection along with hepatitis B. Probably at the same time, you get it from someone who is doubly infected. And Delta and B will both replicate in you. And if you happen to get Delta by itself, it will not replicate because it requires hepatitis B as a helper virus. This is what the genome looks like, hepatitis Delta virus. So 1.7 kilobase RNA, which is extensively base paired. So it looks like a rod, very much like a viroid, right? However, this does encode uh, protein, so it's not, not technically a viroid, but the structure of the viral RNA uh, looks very much like a viroid. It has a ribozyme activity in it, very much like ri uh, viroids, and that's shown by this red dot here, labeled self-cleavage. So these replicate by making concatamers, as you'll see in a moment, and those concatamers are cleaved by the ribozyme that is in the RNA. So we have the genome, which is packaged into particles, and we have the antigenome. Uh, one mRNA is made in infected cells, and this encodes uh, two proteins called uh, delta antigens, and there's a large and a small delta antigen. And these have structural roles. They help to encapsidate the delta uh, RNA genome into the hepatitis B virus uh, particle. So that's a very a standard polyadenylated RNA uh, that is encoded uh, here in the genome. So this, this orange part here shows you where the uh, proteins are encoded. So on the right is a schematic of hepatitis B virus. You may remember uh, it's an envelope virus. It has glycoproteins in the envelope. Uh, we use those glycoproteins to make a virus-like particle vaccine. Inside is a capsid, an icosahedral capsid, and within that is the gapped partially double-stranded DNA genome with a protein and a piece of RNA attached to it. This virus encodes a reverse transcriptase. Here is the hepatitis delta virion. It is also enveloped, uh, and it is packaged with the structural proteins of the hepatitis B virus. So the three glycoproteins of hep B, the L, S, and M, are also present in the envelope of delta. So delta can infect cells via the same entry pathway as hepatitis B. But of course, unless the cell has already got hepatitis um, B in it, it, the virus is not going to replicate hepatitis delta, that is. Inside is the delta genome, that rod-shaped uh, RNA molecule, and both large and small delta antigen help organize the genome. So small delta antigen is bound along the length of the RNA, and then the large delta is thought to anchor uh, the RNA genome to the envelope. So you see the delta antigens play a structural role. They help encapsidate 
uh, the delta genome into the particles. So this genome, this delta genome, if you put it in a cell, it will actually replicate on its own, very much like a viroid. As you'll see in a moment, it, it's replicated by host Paul II. Uh, but it will not be packaged unless hepatitis B virus is providing uh, the structural proteins in the form of the glycoproteins. Okay. So that's the helper function provided by hepatitis B in capsidation. The replication is provided by the host. So that's why I say it's got features of a viroid because it's replicated <coughs> by the host. So here's the viral delta genome. It's considered a minus strand genome RNA. In this case, it is the opposite polarity of message RNA because this does create a message. Uh, and then when this gets into the cell, RNA polymerase II recognizes it as a substrate, which is really remarkable because it is a single-stranded RNA. Although it is highly structured, it is double-stranded, and that may be part of why Paul II recognizes it. Nevertheless, it's copied to make a plus strand, and that's the green molecule here, and concatamers are made, so multiple unit lengths uh, are made, and these are resolved at the ribozyme. The red circle is the self-cleaving site, the ribozyme site, so you get uh, unit length genomes. Here's the mRNA being made, for example, here. Uh, here's a full length uh, plus strand being made. So the full length plus strands circularize, and then they're again copied by Paul II, making minus strands. Full length minus strands, again, they cleave themselves into unit lengths uh, to form the genome. So this will then be packaged into virus particles. Again, so the replication is all taken care of by RNA polymerase II. It's really remarkable and just one protein needed for encapsidation. So that's uh, hepatitis delta virus. The last uh, infectious agent with a genome are virophages. And these are relatively newly discovered. I'm not a big fan of the name, but I'm afraid it's here to stay. It is derived from bacteriophage. Phage is Greek for eat. Bacteriophages were given that name originally when they were discovered the early 1900s because they were, known, they were shown to destroy bacteria. So they were called bacteria eaters, bacteriophages. And these are called virophages by the first discoverers who felt that they were, in a way, eating other viruses. Uh, but they're not really doing that, as you will see. These are circular double-stranded DNA-containing viruses. They typically have an icosahedral capsid. And these were discovered in cells infected with these giant viruses that we've mentioned only briefly, the Mimi viruses, Pandora viruses, Pithovirus, Sibiricum, huge genomes, a million base pairs and greater, with huge capsids, uh, over a micron in length, these viruses, visible in the light microscope. So these virophages were discovered in cells infected with those giant viruses. Now the reason they're called virophages is because they interfere with the replication of the helper. That's not always the case with satellites. They don't interfere with the helper. But these, this class of what I think are really satellites interfere with the helper. Hence, they got this name virophages. So they don't really eat viruses, but they interfere with their replication. However, the press loves this name, and they will not let go of it. So we're stuck with it. So here are some of the virophages uh, that have been discovered and what their hosts are. You can see first at the bottom they are global in their distribution. They're found in both terrestrial and aquatic environments, both freshwater and saltwater environments, all the way down in Antarctica. Uh, there's the first one discovered is was called Sputnik satellite, right? Sputnik. So a little bit of homage to classical virology. Uh, this was originally found in a uh, in an amoeba and Mimi virus is the helper virus for that. Its genome is quite large, much bigger than satellite genomes, 18,000 base pairs, but look, it encodes a lot of proteins. Uh, they all have 20 or more open reading frames. Uh, here's another a virophage of another giant uh, virus called Cafeteria renbergensis virus, organic lake virophage found down here in a freshwater lake in Antarctica. Uh, one, this is a great one, lunt lentil virus <laughs> found in contact lens fluid of a patient with keratitis. Lentille, of course, the French word for lens. So even the French can name their viruses cleverly. Well, actually, most of these were discovered in France by French scientists. And a bunch of in Yellowstone uh, Lake infecting either Mimi viruses or Phycodna viruses. 
uh, and then one in another lake in Antarctica. So very large. I was at a meeting last year where uh, one of the scientists working on these gave a nice talk and he said to me afterwards, don't you think we should call these viruses really? It's kind of insulting to call them satellites because they're big and they have a lot of open reading frames. But the fact is they can't replicate on their own. Otherwise we'd call them viruses. So they are virophages, really a different kind of satellite. And remember, all the satellites I've told you about are RNA genomes. These are DNA, so these are distinct. So they're called virophages. Here's some interesting pictures of cells infected uh, with these satellites along with their helper. So these are cells infected with Mimi viruses largely. And Mimi viruses are these giant particles, about 800 nanometers in diameter here, 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 with a fringe around them. They typically have this interesting fringe. And here are the uh, virophages, Mimi virus, virophage. That's what MVF stands for. You see, they're much smaller particles in there. And this is the factory in which Mimi viruses replicate. Right? These are cytoplasmic inclusions where the virus is replicating its DNA and making its protein. And that's where these uh, virophages replicate. They go right in the factory, use the replication systems of the giant virus, and they inhibit uh, their production. And many weird things happen as a result. Not only do they inhibit the yield of uh, Mimi virus, but they make the particles messed up. So here on the upper right, this Mimi virus actually contains some of these uh, virophages in them. That's what these smaller particles are here and here. Uh, this one is developing some weird uh, multi-lamellar structure on one side of the, of the Mimi virus particle. Again, in, in, as a consequence of having these virophages, here you can see it's wrapped up in that structure. And here it's, uh, is, a, is a larger version of this, this structure. So odd things happen in cells co-infected with uh, these, these viruses. A particularly uh, interesting one that I think sheds some light on the role of virophages uh, in evolution is called uh, Mavirus. This is a virophage of a virus called, that infects a host called Cafeteria roenbergensis. All right, so the virophage infects a virus or it depends on a virus that infects Cafeteria roenbergensis. Roenbergensis is a, a marine flagellate. It, it has the name because it eats everything. So they call it Cafeteria where you can get anything to eat, right? So that's, this is a picture of it up here. So it has a virus that infects it, and in turn, that virus is parasitized by the Ma virus uh, virophage. And this, the study of this uh, virophage has shown that it's probably a gene exchanger. It's probably moving genes among um, vir giant viruses. So it will infect a cell uh, infected with one type of giant virus, pick up some genes from that virus, and move it to another one. You can tell this by sequencing these genomes. So that's why I call them gene exchangers. Now, there's another interesting one found in Organic Lake. I believe that's in Antarctica. Uh, this is a virophage that infects a group of viruses called phycodenoviruses. These infect algae. And the virophages, of course, reduce the cell killing by the phycodenoviruses. All right? And they've done studies and, and modeling in uh, this, this lake in Antarctica. And the idea is that these virophages actually can modulate the populations in these lakes. So in these lakes down in Antarctica, there's not a lot of microbial diversity because there aren't many nutrients in these lakes. And in addition, there's not sun, there's not abundant sun uh, all throughout the year, just during certain times. So these uh, virophages have thought to evolve to uh, modulate the populations, the microbial populations in these lakes. So it's attracting many ecologists who like to study these very simple ecosystems where, you know, there's maybe one microbe per milliliter of water and the diversity is very low. And it looks like these virophages are actually enabling uh, the growth of these populations of cells, the algae, uh, during times when sunlight is scarce. So I think these are basically satellites, except they're bigger. They have DNA genomes. They encode more proteins. And they inhibit the production of the helper. Out on their own, again, they are not able to replicate. If you have a purified um, virophage and put it into a cell, you will not get new particles out. You need to have a helper. So in that sense, they're not a bona fide uh, virus. 
All right, next question is, which of the following statements about satellites is correct? Number four seems to be uh, ahead, but we got a smattering of other things. So let's see what uh, confusion is. There are no human satellites. That's not correct. Delta is a, sh is a satellite, right? They are defective viruses derived from the helper. No, I had a slide which said they are not defective viruses derived from the helper. They are unique entities that have evolved separately. They have evolved to be dependent on the helper, but they are not related to it. Uh, like viroids, they do not encode protein. Satellites do encode some protein, as I've shown you. In plants, they cause symptoms distinct from the helper. That's the correct answer. So the helper causes its own set of symptoms. When you have a satellite present, they're different. Okay. All right, the last thing I want to talk about are infectious proteins. What did I say we're going to call it? Prions? Prions? Prions. Yeah, you elected prions. That's right. Now, here's Prion Road. I really like that. This is actually a real road sign in the UK. No through road, because as you'll see, if you have a prion, prion? <laughs> I can't even remember, prion. If you have a prion disease, it's the end of the line because there's no, nothing we can do for you. Pri pri uh, prions are uh, really, is that wrong, prions? Prions? I like that. Class like prion. Prion? Why can't I remember it? You're the teachers. No, no, I want to do what you guys like, prions. Oh, which means you don't want a final, right? <laughs> prions. Uh, mad cow disease, BSE, uh, Creutzfeldt, Jakob, Scrapey, Kuru. These are all things that are pushed around in the press, and we'll talk about what they are. And the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1997 uh, went to Stanley Prusiner uh, for discovering these and for really pushing the fact that they are infectious proteins. You may be asking yourself, why are we having this in a virology course? Well, you know, when, when Prusiner first discovered these and started to talk about them, nobody would listen except the virologists, so I think it's only fitting. In fact, virology textbooks still talk about uh, prions, so um, that's why it's here. And plus, it's amazing. It's just really interesting. So uh, prions or prions cause transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, which is a really long name for a disease of the brain, encephalopathy. They're transmissible, so it's, infectious, it's got an infectious component. And spongiform refers to the pattern of pathology in the brain. We'll see a slide of that in a bit later. So they are fatal neurodegenerative disorders, uniformly fatal. If you have a prion disease, you will die uh, eventually. And we have thousands uh, diagnosed in people globally every year. 1% uh, of which in, arise by infection, so these can be transmitted, as the name would suggest. But there are other ways to acquire a, a, a TSE, a transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, uh, as we'll see. In 2002, for example, 120 people had contracted one of these TSEs, which is called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, by eating meat. This happened largely in the UK, by eating meat. Uh, from animals that had themselves a TSE called BSE or uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. So the people who ate the meat didn't know it came from cows with TSEs. In fact, the people who sold the cows didn't even know they had TSEs because they didn't have any symptoms. The incubation period is so long that you don't actually know it, that a cow is sick until after you've eaten it. So there was an outbreak of mad cow disease is what this was uh, in 2002. We'll talk about that. Uh, TSEs affect all, all animals, as far as we can tell, not just humans. Uh, cows, in cows, it's called BSE or mad cow disease. In deer or elk or moose, it's called chronic wasting disease. Uh, in uh, Niala, this is a Niala, I didn't know what a Niala was, so I found a picture for you. Uh, in other uh, kudu, these are called exotic ungulates, they can get their own disease. Cats can get it. Sheep and goats can get it, mink can get it. And in people, we recognize uh, a number of different variants which have different incubation periods and different symptoms and different pathologies. Creutzfeldt-Jakob, fatal familial insomnia, gerstmann straussler syndrome, Kuru, and variant CJD, which was the disease most likely caused by 
eating uh, cows with mad cow disease. Now, spongiform, transmissible means infectious, and we'll talk about how it's transmitted in a moment. Spongiform refers to the fact that the brain of someone with a TSE has a sponge-like appearance. It has holes in it. Uh, and associated with this is psychomotor dysfunction. So you have, you have increasing difficulty, not only walking, but uh, processing information. And again, those different names that I just told you, they, they have various symptoms depending on what part of the brain is damaged. But each disease is characteristic. Kreutzfeldt-Jakob is different from Kuru, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a section of brain from someone uh, with a TSE, an advanced TSE, obviously after death. And you can see this is completely abnormal. Uh, not only are there long fibrils of protein, which are the prion protein aggregating, but there are also holes uh, as well. And that's where the name spongiform came from. The first TSC to be recognized was called scrapie. And this was found by farmers in the UK who noticed that their sheep would, would rub themselves on fences and scrape off a lot of their fur or hair, whatever it is that sheep have. And uh, they gave the name scrapie. And these animals uh, have motor disturbances, much like human TSEs, trembling. In fact, in uh, Canada, it was called tremblant du mouton. That was the name given to it initially because the sheep are trembling uncontrollably. They get paralyzed. Uh, they lose weight, and then they die four to six weeks. Very quick in sheep, but much longer in people. So this has been known for over 250 years in Europe as a, a disease, but what the etiology was uh, wasn't known. Uh, and in some countries, it continues uh, unabated. In the UK, 1% of all the sheep in the UK develop scrapie every year. And there's really nothing you can do about this. We have no way of stopping the disease once it starts. We have problems even diagnosing it. We don't have a good diagnostic yet because it's just a protein after all. We can't do PCR, although people are developing some methods. Uh, and by the time you see it, it's too late to do anything with the animals. So here's a sheep with scrapie, and the only thing you can see here is that uh, it seems very unhappy, and it's lost a lot of its hair, fur or hair by rubbing itself uh, on fences. So again, this is a 100% fa fatal disease in, in sheep, uh, probably transmitted from, from animal to animal, or perhaps even out in the fields uh, through contaminated fecal material in the, in the pastures and so forth. Now the farmers actually started to figure out what was going on years ago. Uh, they found that if you introduced a sick animal into a healthy herd, it would transmit scrapie to the rest of the herd. So they thought very early on that this must be some kind of uh, infectious agent. In 1939, they did the virus experiment. They took brains from sheep who had died of scrapies, homogenized them, and put them through a 0.2 micron filter which would retain everything but viruses. And they found that you could take the filtrate and inoculate it into new sheep and they would get the disease. So it passes through a filter. So there was some thought that maybe this was a virus uh, infection. However, um, very quickly after these initial studies, it became clear that the agent, and remember in 1939 we know about viruses already, the agent was really resistant to things that would damage nucleic acid like ultraviolet light, uh, ionizing radiation, formaldehyde, so resistant. So doses of these that would inactivate nucleic acids had no effect uh, on the agent, whatever it was that was passing this disease. So the idea began to emerge that there's no nucleic acid in this agent. No nucleic acid, this was sort of heretical, right, because the viruses and bacteria have nucleic acids. And but the fact that this passed through a filter was thought to indicate that this, in fact, um, was a virus. But this is where Stan Prusiner and others began to champion the idea of no nucleic acid, and they weren't really accepted. They were thought to be uh, off base. And even to this day, there are critics who don't believe uh, this is true. But I think the evidence is, is overwhelming that these are infectious proteins. So this is an experiment that was done that shows the uh, resistance of these agents to ionizing radiation. So what this is, is a 
correlation between the molecular weight of the nucleic acid, and we're looking at different viruses here, DNA viruses and RNA viruses on the two curves, and increasing doses of uh, irradiation in RADs here. Okay, so this is just uh, uh, irradiation on the bottom. And then we're looking at the uh, infectivity uh, of the genome. Uh, so basically this is the infectivity, this is the amount of irradiation need to inactivate herpes simplex. So herpes has a big genome, so it's a big target. You don't need a lot of irradiation to inactivate infectivity. When you irradiate the genome, it causes breaks or crosslinks, and the virus is not infectious. As the virus gets smaller, you need more and more irradiation to inactivate the infectivity. So here's SV40, remember a small circular DNA containing virus, small target, so you need a lot of radiation to inactivate its infectivity. Same with RNA viruses, the bigger ones uh, need less irradiation uh, than the smaller ones. But here is Scrapey. Scrapey fits onto both curves, but it's way up here at the end. It needs a lot of irradiation to irradiate its, its, uh, its biological activity, and this is, of course, is an assay where you irradiate and then you put it into an animal like a sheep and you wait for disease to develop. So one of the experiments that showed that there probably is a nucleic acid in these because if there is, it's more resistant than any other viral nucleic acid that we know about. So human and animal TSEs are very similar. Histochemically, you have a number of appearances that uh, overlap between sheep and cow and human TSEs. You can see some of them here. Vacualization of various cell types in the brain. Neuronal loss, which accounts for paralysis and psychomotor dysfunction. The spongiform appearance is the same in animals and in people. Uh, the, the accumulation of, of protein in clumps. And uh, amyloidosis is another characteristic of these diseases. Fibrils of amyloid protein form in the brain. So again, human and animal TSC is very similar. Uh, the way we eventually detected the agent was by injecting organ homogenates into species, as I've told you already, uh, with sheep. And then after months or years of incubation, you see the symptoms, the typical symptoms of the TSEs. Now in sheep, it's a relatively short incubation period, but they're not a very convenient animal model. And so people have moved into rodents, hamsters, and so forth, in which the incubation period can be over a year, depending on how you do the experiment. So these are really, really arduous experiments. When you inject uh, organ homogenates into these animals, they, they accumulate in the lymph system, and then they spread eventually to the CNS. So the protein makes its way into the CNS. Uh, and then you get the pathology in the CNS. Now, interestingly, unlike any other infectious agent that we've talked about, uh, there's no immune response <coughs> whatsoever. There's no inflammation. There's no innate response. There's no antibody produced. There are no T cells, no natural killer cells, macrophages. And that's because this is a normal cellular protein. Why would you get an immune response against it? And you'll, you'll see how that works in a moment. So the problem with TSEs today, and I said they still occur uh, in, in the numbers of thousands globally, is that you don't know someone has a TSE until they develop symptoms. Um, and then you see psychomotor dysfunction, and you can get a diagnosis. Uh, of a TSC in a variety of ways, but then there's no way to treat it. We have no treatments, we have no drugs, we have no therapies. So in people, it's, as it is in animals, it's invariably fatal. So this is obviously uh, an area of active research, although the, the number of cases are small still, you would like to be able to sort out ways to treat them. Way back in 1967, before Stan Prusiner, uh, Griffith said, I think these are proteins. These are infectious proteins, and that's where the name came from. I think, uh, actually, Prusiner developed the name prion. Proteinaceous infectious particles. And he, he identified these complexes in the brain of uh, she scrapey sheep, and he purified the protein to, to homogeneity and transmitted it to other animals to prove that it was a single protein that was causing the infection. So prion. It's encoded by a gene that's in all of us called the PRNP gene. And if you don't have this gene, you don't get TSEs, but unfortunately in humans, as far as we know, there isn't anyone that lacks this gene. You can knock it out in mice, and the mice seem to be okay, and they won't get TSEs if you inject them uh, with a mouse prion protein, for example. Now back here in the 80s and 90s, 
people still said, well, Prusiner, your protein is contaminated with nucleic acid and you just can't detect it. So we had to work very hard for many years to silence uh, those skeptics. Uh, and then with the advent of cloning, he was able to show that you could take the gene, the PRNP gene, make the protein, and then administer it to an animal and it would cause the prion disease. So, but still people say, oh, there's some nucleic acid in there from the clone and that's what's causing it. So it's actually reminiscent of the old debate over what the genetic material was. So you remember that people thought initially in the 30s and 40s that genetic material was protein because there are so many different amino acids. It couldn't be nucleic acid because there are only four different bases. And for years after the transformation experiment of Avery, McLeod, and McCarty, people said, oh, your nucleic acid's contaminated with protein. And you get the same, now it's the reverse, but they told Prusiner for years, your protein is contaminated with nucleic acid. So the current view is that the pathogenic protein is a conformational isoform of what our normal host protein is. So PRP, prion protein cellular, is the normal protein that has a function in us, in our CNS. It's normally folded, but it, when it gets misfolded, it becomes a conformational isoform, it becomes pathogenic. So the normal protein is on the outer surface of neurons. It's linked by a GPI anchor, and it has a particular role in neurons. Uh, but under some conditions, it misfolds, and then the misfolding <coughs> propagates, all right? So you can introduce an abnormal conformer into an organism. So you take a sheep with scrapie, you purify the protein, it's abnormally folded. You inject that into other sheep. It causes the normal protein in those sheep to misfold, and it propagates. You get more and more proteins misfolded until the disease develops. All right, so the abnormal conformer, which we call PRPSC, in honor of the scrapie origin of our understanding, uh, this catalyzes the conversion of normal cellular PRPC into the pathogenic conformation the conformationally altered isoform. It's really a remarkable uh, way to, that it works. So we have a normal protein in us. If you acquire the abnormally folded protein, it will cause all of your normal protein to misfold and then you develop the disease. All right, so that's illustrated here. Here is on the right, the normal structure of, of the PRP, prion protein. The Pathogenic conversion involves the conformational uh, alteration. Lots of beta strands here you can see, uh, and that's the pathogenic conformation. And if you mix this PRPSC with PRPC, even you could do this in vitro, it will cause PRPC to misfold like PRPSC. You just need the protein present. You don't have to have it co-translational or anything. Just mixing the two proteins will cause this conformational change. So this is also reflected in the biochemical properties of the protein. Here is the PRPC protein, the normal cellular protein here, with just some uh, motifs indicated uh, here. Uh, here's the GPI anchor that links it to the cell membrane. If you digest it with a protease called proteinase K, it gets completely digested into small bits, small amino acids. The conformational uh, altered protein, PRPSC, when you treat that with proteinase K, it's, it's relatively resistant to digestion. Only the N-terminus is digested away. So this was early on a diagnostic for seeing if an animal had scrapie. You could just take a brain extract and digest uh, and do a Western blot, and you could see that if you had this proteinase K-resistant form, it indicated that you had uh, PRPSC present. So that's what is happening during development of the disease. The PRPC is going to PRPSC. So uh, we've told, I've already told you that one way you can do this is by introducing PRPSC into the organism. Yes? Is there a mutation associated with the misfolding or? Sometimes. I'm gonna to get to that. Yes. Yes. So why doesn't the body see the PRPSC as altered cells? Right, so the question is why, doesn't, why don't we see PRPSC as altered? And I don't know the answer to that. It sees it as self so it doesn't make an immune response. I guess that during thymus development, there must be some of this present, and so, it's rec so the T cells that recognize it are eliminated, and so it's recognized itself, but it's an interesting question. Don't know the answer, yeah. Right, yes, so could you make a vaccine? So um, 
I think the answer is no, because this is recognized as self. Although you might be able to couple it to something to make it unique enough to generate an antibody response would be, which would be specific to this conformation. People are trying to do that. Yeah. Um, how yep. does, you said the PRPC somehow changes regular, pro, the PRSC changes regular proteins to like from PPRC to like PRSC. How does that happen? Ah, so how does PRPSC change this? We, this is the million dollar question that people are trying to answer. Uh, it must interact with it, but how it converts it is absolutely unknown. The protein obviously has the ability to have multiple conformations, and how it's transmitted isn't known. But as you'll see later, this is actually not a unique phenomenon. There are other proteins that can change their conformational states. Can that protein, one more question, that hmm? PRPC, is it possible that in the cell it can also have like different, does it, is it ever found regularly in the cell as PRPC? Okay, so that's a good question. Do you ever find PRPC and PRPSC in the normal cell? It hasn't, but I'll bet it's there in very low quantities, and that's part of the answer as to why you probably can't make antibodies against this because it's recognized as self. I suspect there's a dynamic equilibrium of PRPC and SC in us, and that's probably important, but for some reason, at some time, the conversion goes one way and you get disease. So if you make mice that lack both copies of the PR and P gene, these are resistant to infection with mouse uh, prions. Um, so you can introduce prions into animals. We've talked a lot about that. You can take scrapie prions from the brain of scrapie mice, uh, scrapie sheep, and inject them into uh, other sheep or even mice, and you will get development of the disease. But also rare mutations in the gene which occur can lead to uh, conversion to PRPSC. So whether you infect with the protein or you have these mutations, uh, the protein accumulates in the brain and that's what leads to the symptoms. So there are three types of spongiform encephalopathies. Then there's the infectious or transmissible kind which we've talked about largely. Uh, it goes from animal to animal. You consume infected meat, you get a TSC. There's also familial spongiform encephalopathy. This is caused by an inherited mutation. Uh, so one of your parents has a mutation in the PR and P gene. You inherited it and you develop a TSC. But maybe your parent didn't, so the contributing factor is not really clear. Then there's sporadic encephalopathy, where there's no mutation. You haven't eaten any contaminated material. It just develops. The protein must misfold incorrectly, and then once there's enough of the misfolded protein, it just keeps going on. So we think that um, you can you can find all three of these types of TSCs in animals uh, and you can transmit it by the, the diseased tissue. So no matter how the TSC emerges, by infection, familial, or sporadic, you can transmit it because the PRPSC protein is infectious. All right, and what we think is that um, throughout animal development, these have arisen spontaneously and then animals consume other animals and transmit the infection. And so probably we acquired it originally uh, by a mutation, uh, and we also acquired by eating infected animals. Yes? Uh, for those people who got the disease from eating infected meat, right. does that mean they weren't cooking it properly? Or does heat oh, you could cook this for two days and you wouldn't. And this protein is so resistant to autoclaving. That's one of the things. It was originally transmitted by corneal transplants because even if you autoclave the, the, the um, tools, you wouldn't, you wouldn't destroy the infectivity of this protein. It's highly resistant. Yes? Could it be also like a, a problem with the, like the folding chaperones that help the proteins fold up? So could the chaperones that are needed for folding be partly responsible for the misfolding? I think that's an idea, but I have never seen anything that points to a particular chaperone that's involved. So I'm not sure if it's if it's correct or not, but it's a good idea. Yes? So in the labs, uh, people who are working with uh, young proteins, how do they destroy it? I mean, because it's so dangerous. They try and make it in the lab. They don't want to destroy it. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, whoever is like, working, the, figuring out the structure yeah. and everything, how do they handle the uh, Well, 
you have to be careful. I mean, the, the, the way that most people acquire these is by ingesting, e eating cow meat, for example, or getting a, a human product like a blood transfusion, a corneal transfusion. Um, human growth hormone made from people was contaminated with prions years ago, and that transmitted a lot of the disease. Very difficult to acquire in the laboratory. If you do standard P BSL-2 practice, it's fine. You can boil it in nine molar acid and destroy its infectivity if you want to. So there are ways to do it. But you know, these are not, compa these are not normal ways uh, of getting rid of it. So some human TSEs, uh, Kuru, um, iatrogenic spread by transplantation, as I've just said, infected corneas, hormones, transfusion from patients with, before we knew about this, we were giving blood from people with TSEs before their symptoms and people who got the blood would get it. Uh, feeding infected animals to cattle, we'll talk about that in a moment, and that's called variant uh, CJD. So the first human TSE was Kuru, which was the fatal disease found in the four people of New Guinea, right here. Uh, this is at a 30-year incubation period, and a, a virologist from the US, Carlton Gaidusek, went there to study it, and he figured out that it was spread uh, among women and children through them eating the brains of their relatives who died. So this was a ritual in this tribe to eat, the women and kids only would eat the brain of the people who died and they transmitted Kuru. So he convinced them not to do this and so now there's no more Kuru uh, in New Guinea. But that was the first one that he sorted out. Uh, in cows, forced cannibalism has resulted in bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Now the cows, as you will see, so there was an outbreak of BSE in British cows. Uh, here's a cow with uh, uh, near-end uh, TSC. Um, it's because these cows were fed meat from animals that also had TSCs. Um, so it, cows for many years were fed processed animal byproducts. They would basically blast all the flesh off of a dead sheep or a pig or something else and grind it up. It would be a protein supplement to the cow, so it would grow faster because if you just let cows eat grass or corn, they don't grow so fast. You give them some protein, they grow really quickly. Uh, in the 1970s, this is called meat and bone meal. The processing changed uh, so that scrapey proteins could now survive and pass into cows. So previously there was a process that involved ways that would inactivate the protein. So there was an outbreak of BSE in cows, and this clearly came from having, for example, sheep meat with scrapie in it in the ground up meat that you were feeding uh, to the cows. However, uh, a lot of these, this cow meat got into the human food chain, uh, and that resulted in variant kreutzfeldt jakob So again, the problem is that you don't know that a cow has TSE when you slaughter it uh, to bring to market. So here's an epidemic curve of this outbreak, about a 1.2 million cattle were estimated to be infected. So here's the problem, the incubation time is five years for TSC before you see a cow looking like that cow in the previous picture. But you slaughter them between two and three years after birth, so you know that there are, uh, that there are prions in those animals. So here's the outbreak, these are the number of cases uh, in the thousands starting in 1987. And immediately after several thousand cases, it was realized that it was coming from the meat and bone meal. It was banned, but it was too late because there's such a long incubation period. So the epidemic in cows, BSC peaked and went down, but then the outbreak started up in people. Again, a long incubation period, uh, and then that peaked and went down. So why is it so long? Well, I think it takes a long time for that pathogenic protein to convert all the endogenous protein into a state that gives you diseased tissue. Uh, unfortunately, we still have BSE in cattle. Um, I remember teaching this course in 2012, and the day after this lecture, in, in the news, there was a cow in California had been discovered with BSE. How? How? How was it discovered? <laughs> uh, it had signs of TSE, so I think this was an older cow that was allowed to get old enough so that it would show symptoms of disease. In 2003, there were 1,390 cows found. And I think lots of cows probably have it, and we're just slaughtering them before we see it. We think that the cow disease is sporadic. So in other words, the protein misfolds in the cow and they get the TSC. So it's not genetic or transmitted. So we need to protect the food supply, but the problem is we don't test 
uh, most of the meat, less than 2% of the meat that we make here in the U and in Canada is actually tested for the presence of prions. Even though we have diagnostic tests, you know, it's very expensive to do this. So in some countries, every animal is tested for, for BSE, but not here. And people are looking for drugs that would block the accumulation of these prions, and that may be something that works out in the future. Sporadic Kreutzfeldt uh, uh somewhere less than one million people worldwide. It typically affects older people. This is about 65% of human TSEs, and as I said, this happens with no warning. I have normal genes, and of course, you can transmit it to others if you have a developing sporadic TSE, but you don't have symptoms and you donate a body part or you donate blood or something, you could transmit it. And that's how we think Kuru was established in New Guinea. So that first person who had a sporadic uh, Kuru in New Guinea, they ate, the women and children ate that brain and that started to uh, spread it in the population. Sorry. A familial is an inherited disease. This is associated with autosomal dominant mutations. We have a whole list of specific amino acids that predispose this. And this, again, can be transmitted to uh, other people if you give uh, body, human products to them. So again, to summarize all of this, we have a normal protein, PRPC. If you eat meat that is contaminated with uh, a pathogenic prion, that's what this means plus here. You convert this PRPC into PRPSC and you develop the disease. That's the infectious form because you're eating a protein which is causing the disease. Uh, the genetic form or the familial form, uh, you have inherited a mutation uh, from your parents that causes misfolding of the protein. And then there's the spontaneous uh, disease the protein spontaneously misfolds, maybe it's involving a chaperone, maybe there are other factors, that's the sporadic. All three, same disease outcome, all three can be transmitted if uh, material is, is transmitted to another animal. Now there is a species barrier that has uh, been recognized that if you put disease brain material into the same species, like mouse to mouse or sheep to sheep, you get disease, but different species inoculation is inefficient. So, for example, if you go from sheep to mouse, it takes a long time to get the disease. So the sequence of the protein in the donor and the host should be the same to get maximal efficiency. And we've recognized this uh, species barrier. So if you put uh, cow, PRP, SC uh, into mice, the disease is, is inefficiently generated. But if you make transgenic mice that synthesize bovine PRPC, and then you give those animals uh, BSC prions, they now get efficiently infected. So having the same protein as the donor is very important for efficient infection. We don't quite understand that, but it probably has something to do uh, with how the protein misfolding is catalyzed. The problem is that cow prion has a broad host range. It infects many other meat-eating mammals, including us. That's why we got BSC from cows. So the species barrier here is not great. So some prions can overcome the barrier. And that's why we worry about BSC, because cow BSC can readily go uh, into people. Uh, the disease in deer, elk, and moose is on the rise. These are areas of Canada and the US in yellow, where there are infected cervid populations. These are cervids. Uh, and if you go to this website, it tells you if you are a hunter what to do. If you, you know, hunt a, a wild deer. So this deer could have chronic wasting disease, which is the name of this TSC. You wouldn't know it because maybe the symptoms haven't developed yet. So if you, if you take the, the animal apart in the field, they say stay away from the spinal cord and brain. Stay away from the lymph nodes where the pathogenic proteins are likely to be. So the horror is that it's going to get into the human uh, into humans via consuming uh, deer because as you know people do hunt deer in these areas and even some infected deer in New York State. 90% um, of standing herds of deer and elk are positive for TSEs and wild animals high as 15%. We don't know how they're transmitted. Maybe it's excreted in the feces and the animals uh, eat it or maybe saliva contamination. Uh, but in the lab anyway you can transmit the deer disease to cows. So people are worried that, you know, cows are out the pasture and at night the deer come and they eat the grass and they may contaminate the grass with saliva or feces. And then the next morning the cows come in and they, they pick up deer prions and 
develop TSE, and then eventually gets into the food chain. So there's some concern about this, as you might understand. So this just gives you a summary of all these different sorts of uh, origins of TSEs. So here we have uh, people eating uh, BSE contaminated meat. Uh, and those, some of those individuals passed the disease on to other people when they gave blood or corneas or whatever before they were recognized to have the disease. We think the disease went from cattle to, a, to other cows, to a variety of uh, animals who are fed cow meat, even to cats, domestic cats fed uh, cow meat as part of their cat food have been shown to get, poor kitty gets a, a TSC, right? Where did this all originate? Well, probably it started uh, with spontaneous disease uh, in sheep and perhaps elk. Um, the, the minks might have picked it up from eating uh, some, some sheep as well. Uh, and in people, uh, it's probably a sporadic disease originally uh, and then passed on to other people uh, by contaminated material. The last question is, which of the following illustrate the prion species barrier? All right, number two is the correct answer. Mice fed hamster PRP SC do not develop disease unless they have the hamster transgene. That illustrates the species barrier, not any of the others. Now, I just want to leave you with the important uh, fact that not all prions cause disease. There are prions in yeast and other fungi that don't cause disease, but they can switch conformations just like the pathogenic ones. And these are thought to be epigenetic switches that allow proteins to have different functions and allow, for example, a yeast, if it changes its environment and there are fewer nutrients, it can alter a protein's function just by conformational switches. And there have been a lot of these discovered uh, in yeast. These are the gene names uh, and these are the prion state, so different names depending uh, on prion or normal. And then there's the function normally and the consequences of the prion state. So the prion protein that we've talked about today uh, normally has a function in neuronal growth, but of course when it's conformationally altered, it's causing disease. But all of these other prions in yeasts have another function of the protein. For example, this, this URE3 uh, gene is normally, URE2 is normally a repressor of transcription of nitrogen catabolic genes. But when it switches to the prion state, again, it's a conformationally altered state, just like PRPSC, it now allows utilization of other sources of nitrogen. So these are good things. The proteins can switch conformation and allow them to have other properties. So it could very well be that having this conformational switch ability is actually good in evolutionary terms. And for some reason, uh, the PRPCSC switch that may have a good function that we're not aware of, but most of the time it is leading to pathogenesis.